So good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to our uh, virtual town hall on kidney care during COVID-19. My name is Barbara Fain. I'm the executive director of the Betsy Weeman Center. Uh, the Betsy Weeman Center is a Massachusetts state government agency that works together with providers, patients, and policymakers to promote the safety and quality of health care. And in that spirit of collaboration, uh, we're really delighted to be partnering with two leading kidney disease organizations on today's town hall. Uh, first, the American Kidney Fund, um, which fights uh, kidney disease on all fronts as the nation's leading kidney nonprofit. Um, the, the fund works on behalf of the 37 million Americans living with kidney disease and the millions more at risk with a wide range of programs that support people wherever they are in their fight against kidney disease from prevention through transplant. The uh, IPRO End Stage Re Renal Disease Network Program works with dialysis centers here uh, in New England and all across the country to promote healthcare for all end stage renal disease patients. Uh, um, and, and so that that care is safe, effective, efficient, patient centered, and equitable. Um, I know that uh, we have um, a number of people joining us today from, uh, from the American Kidney Fund leadership as well as from the IPRO ESRD networks. Um, so I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Laverne Burton, President and CEO of the American Kidney Fund, and also uh, say hello to Michael Spiegler, Vice President of Patient Services um, and uh, uh, Kidney Disease Education at the Fund. Um, also want to give a shout out to the IPRO uh, ESRD Networks 1, 2, 6, and 9, who uh, between them uh, uh, cover so much of uh, the country from New England to Georgia to the Ohio River Valley and, uh, and more. Um, so we're excited to begin the program, uh, but before we do, uh, we uh, will uh, just share a few um, housekeeping items. Um, I know that um, that uh, some of you have become experts on Zoom uh, uh, in, in the past couple of months and some are new to it. Um, but uh, just a few things uh, to share with you and you can see on the, uh, you can see on the slide um, that you can send uh, chat questions to, uh, to the speakers, to the presenters uh, as we're going along. So you don't have to wait till the end to the Q&A. You can just kind of enter your questions and we'll, we'll come back to uh, come back to them. And so as you can see uh, on your screen, there's a chat icon that you can click on that opens up a box and you just type and uh, hit return uh, to send a message from, from that box. Um, it would also help us to know if your question is uh, for a specific presenter and we're gonna address as many of your questions as we can at the, uh, at the end during the Q&A. Um, one thing I wanna mention is uh, that the meeting is being recorded as are the chats so your videos um, will not be, don't worry, they won't be displayed in our recording, but your, uh, any spoken comments uh, uh, will be. Um, and if you, you know, if you have any concerns about uh, recording, just you can send a chat uh, to the Betsy Lehman Center. Um, I also want to um, mention that uh, the slides and all of the other resources that we, um, that we, that we show you today, they're gonna be posted online later, uh, later, later on on the Betsy Lehman uh, website and we will uh, put um, in, uh, and you can see it coming up in the chat box now, there's the, the, the link to, to our website. Um, so uh, you don't have to worry if you, if you feel like you miss anything. And then finally, one more thing uh, before we dive in, um, I'm gonna pull up uh, a short poll, um, uh, just an icebreaker poll, and you're gonna see um, some questions pop up on your screen. And uh, you can click next to the answers for you know as many as you'd like, and just go ahead as I'm talking. Just go ahead and start uh, start answering, um, and then uh, you just click submit to, to send us uh, to send us your responses. So I'm going to give you a minute to do that, and um, and then we will share your answers. It's just a little bit uh, little bit of a um, sort of icebreaker so that we can. Um, we really want this whole session uh, today to be um, as interactive as, as, as possible. And, um, and this one will let us get a sense of you and sort of who's, who, who's, in, who's in our kind of virtual room here. And I'll just pause for a minute. Okay, so 
Now I'm going to share the share the results and um, and uh, you know we will have other people joining us. I think there are 95 of us I, I can see uh, on uh, on, uh, on the, in the meeting at the moment. Um, so great. All right. All right. So. Um, I'd now uh, uh, like to introduce, I'm very excited to introduce our first speaker, uh, uh, Dr. Daniel Wiener. Um, he's going to discuss what kidney patients need to know about uh, coronavirus. Uh, Dr. Wiener is a nephrologist at Tufts Medical Center. Uh, he's um, also associate a professor of medicine at Tufts University and the medical director for clinical research for Dialysis Clinic, Inc. Uh, he's been involved in kidney policy as the recent chair of the American Society of Nephrology's Quality Committee. And he's also the editor in chief of Kidney Medicine, which is a new journal from the National Kidney Foundation. So um, without further ado, over, over to you. All right. uh, thank you so much, Barbara. Um, and um, thank you very much for having me. Um, if you see my screen, you can see I'm going to be talking about physical distancing, um, hence in the middle of nowhere in the desert here. Um, so this is gonna be a really quick run through in terms of just some key take home points um, for kidney patients and for the kidney community. Just things that are emerging in, in what's really a rapidly changing and very fluid situation. So we'll talk a little bit about um, physical distancing, a little bit about testing and isolation, which I, I think is an area where we have the most uncertainty right now. And I know where I personally have the most questions. And then talk a little bit about various different patient groups, so people who are treated with hemodialysis, home dialysis, kidney transplant, and chronic kidney disease, and, and try to get all this done in about 10 minutes. Uh, so next slide, please. So I think the first thing is physical distancing, and this was initially called social distancing, um, but it's been changed to physical distancing just out of recognition that social distancing is a really tough term. By nature of being people, we are naturally social. It's important that we maintain our interactions with other people and continue to engage with our friends, our families, um, one way or another. So physical distancing is sort of the preferred term. And having my last name being Wiener, um, I really liked this picture, although it does say social distancing. But just for a little bit of background, um, as many of you guys probably know, COVID-19 spreads pretty much person to person. It's not impossible to get it off of um, a substance or a surface, but it's largely person to person spread via respiratory droplets. It requires relatively close contact with people. Um, some people have said three feet, some have said six, depending on the environment. If you're in an indoors enclosed space with very little air circulation, um, closer um, risk can happen with slightly longer distances. Um, and it requires probably a fairly significant amount of virus to be spread from a person into the air that then goes into another person. The other key thing that's really emerged and that we didn't know really at the start of the pandemic in the United States is that asymptomatic and presymptomatic people can spread COVID-19. And this is probably the biggest challenge. So people can be spreading this disease before they even know that they're sick. Um, and this has led to many of the guidelines regarding quarantine for people who let's say live with somebody who has COVID-19, people who reside in long-term care facilities and others. In general, the best way to prevent spread of disease is just through general good practices. So wearing masks, um, this protects other people from you because if you cough or sneeze, a lot of what happens gets caught into the mask, um, may provide a little bit of protection for you from other people. Washing your hands regularly and just maintaining good distance. I think the other key thing here is just to make sure you let your healthcare provider know if a close contact of yours has COVID-19. I know we've had many experiences in our dialysis unit and in our hospital um, where people have had high level exposures and we probably just haven't been asking the right questions or other factors. And so these go unrecognized and prevent, present a real threat um, for transmission. So next slide, please. So what happens when you have COVID-19? I think what everybody wants to know um, is how long am I going to be isolated? How long am I contagious for? Um, what am I gonna have to do? So the current guidance is actually not based on the greatest evidence um, and can adopt one of two different strategies. And you'll find that different hospitals and different dialysis units are doing different things based upon the availability of testing. 
So the first strategy is a time-based um, or symptom-based strategy, which looks at at least 10 days after illness onset and at least three days after recovery. This means no more fevers um, without taking acetaminophen, Tylenol, um, a real marked improvement in symptoms. The test-based strategy is probably preferred for most of the people on this phone call, actually. Healthcare providers, um, dialysis patients, their families, and people who are exposed to immunosuppressed, where you have resolution of fever and improvement in symptoms, and then negative results from two tests at least 24 hours apart. And the reason why they're requesting two tests in this is because you can have false negatives. So a test can be negative when somebody still um, is carrying virus or viral fragments. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, next slide, please. So what do we know about testing for coronavirus? And this is from the CDC. Um, and this slide um, is um, from a study in China um, in 56 patients who experienced mild to moderate illness. So these were not people who required ventilators or prolonged ICU hospitalizations. And what you can see by looking at this is that the testing, the nasal or the throat swabs that people are doing for testing can remain positive for a long time. Um, about one in three patients were still positive at four weeks. Um, next slide, please. It's hard to know what this means though, um, because what the CDC has also done, and this is a study published in a journal called Nature, is attempted to grow um, virus from these swabs. And they've been unable to grow the virus after about eight or nine days from symptom onset. So you can have people who are still testing positive for a prolonged period of time. In this study, people were testing positive for up to two weeks, but they really couldn't grow the virus after about eight days. So it makes people uncertain as to what's going on for people who are still persistently positive um, as to whether they're truly contagious or not. And that's what's led to some of these different guidelines. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a, another slide really showing that. Again, eight to nine days, but people are still testing um, positive for a prolonged period of time with the swabs. So ultimately, we don't really know the answer to this, but the best evidence in my personal interpretation of this to date is that for otherwise healthy, high-functioning people who are going about their ordinary lives every day, they're probably okay with re-exposing to society based on that 10-3 guidance. For people who are spending a lot of time in dialysis units or around a lot of people who are very susceptible, you may want to be a little bit more cautious because we don't know the answer to that. And for people who are dialysis patients or people who are otherwise have gotten very sick, we don't know if they're going to have more trouble clearing the virus um, than otherwise younger, healthier people would. So a testing-based approach or extending those times may be more appropriate in those populations. Next slide, please. The one other thing that really jumped out at me, and this is from an article we published in Kidney Medicine, it's one of, from one of the early reports um, from China. And what they said is that although seven hemodialysis patients died during the epidemic, including six with and one without COVID-19 infection, this is from one dialysis facility, no patient in their group died of severe pneumonia caused by COVID-19. And interestingly, the major cause of death was cardiovascular events which seem to be related to insufficient dialysis due to patients missing hemodialysis sessions to avoid possible infection. And I think this is really important. It, it speaks to the fact that hemodialysis for patients, for those who are treated with hemodialysis, is really a life-saving treatment. It's, it's an essential treatment, and there's a lot of risk with missing hemodialysis. Um, this is obviously a time of tremendous uncertainty. Um, and the dialysis unit can be a scary place, and getting to the dialysis unit can be a scary, pla scary place. But working with your healthcare providers, it's really important to make sure that you can get your dialysis and get it in as safe a way as possible. And that's, I think, one of my major take homes from this whole experience. Next slide. Um, so this is a picture of our dialysis unit as we were preparing for a, a COVID shift that we have. Um, and as I'm sure many of you know who are dialysis patients or family members of dialysis patients, we've been working really hard in this setting to try to minimize risk and to try to recognize people who may have COVID as early as possible. Um, a lot of this is incumbent on patients and their families before they even come to dialysis, just to make sure you have an open line of communication with your dialysis facility. 
that you're wearing a mask and that you let the dialysis unit know if you are sick or you've had a, an exposure to somebody who is sick. Um, we're getting more and more experience with this, particularly in areas like Boston, where, which are hot spots. And I think every dialysis unit really wants to work with every dialysis patient as to how to get them to dialysis, make sure they get the dialysis that they need in as safe a way as possible. When you get to dialysis, it gets a little bit tricky. I mean, everybody's used to waiting in the waiting room, talking, hanging out beforehand, and that's a tough thing. Um, waiting rooms are crowded and can be dangerous places. Oftentimes, you'll have a symptom questionnaire. Um, almost every place I know of is checking temperatures. Some are checking pulse oximetry, and then are making a triage decision. Um, we'll talk about that in one slide. The last thing is transportation. And I think this is the hardest thing, and I don't really want to go into that, but just for people who do have COVID, transportation does become an issue. And it's something where hopefully you'll be able to work with your dialysis facility to try to make sure you can get to dialysis and get home from dialysis as safely as possible. Next slide, please. So what happens if you're confirmed or if you're a PUI, a person under investigation? Well, dialysis units are doing different things. Some of them have dedicated COVID shifts. Usually it's the evening shift um, so that the unit can be cleaned afterwards. There are some dedicated COVID facilities and some have either isolation rooms or really have segregated off large portions of facilities to treat patients um, with COVID in more of an isolated area and reduce the likelihood of spread. It's very much the same for persons under investigation where you have the same sort of procedures. Um, I personally think, and as you probably have heard, those who are dialysis patients who are in long-term um, care facilities, I think are at particularly high risk, um, both um, of acquiring COVID in the facilities, potentially acquiring in the dialysis unit, and or spreading within both of these facilities as they go back and forth. And so these are people I would always treat as persons under investigation. I also feel, and this is a belief of mine, is that a dialysis provider um, should provide outpatient hemodialysis if it's clinically safe to do so for the patient. So if the patient is stable, if they're breathing well, they're oxygenating okay and feeling okay, we should do everything we can to provide dialysis in that outpatient setting, um, assuming that we're set up to do so. And that the dialysis provider should come up with contingencies and plans to be able to dialyze as much as possible in the outpatient setting and not send people to the hospitals. Next slide, please. With home dialysis, um, I think this is, if you have to be on dialysis, um, I'm sure people are very happy that they're on home dialysis. It avoids the need to come to a dialysis unit. Um, in many cases, even for monthly visits, um, these are being increasingly done via telehealth. And it just highlights some of the things that came out in the executive order last year, whereby there's a real drive to get people at home more than they already are. And you can see some of the advantages of, of this with the current pandemic. Um, next slide. What about kidney transplant patients? And here there's not a lot of data. I can say if you're on a waiting list for kidney transplant, it's pretty unlikely that you're gonna get transplanted during the pandemic. Um, and many living donor transplants have already been delayed. The exceptions that I've seen and I've heard about from many of the academic hospitals are highly sensitized individuals to where there's a very limited number of kidneys that are, would be available. And people who are listed for multi-organ transplants like heart kidney or liver kidney. When it comes to immunosuppression, this holds for transplant people or people with chronic kidney disease who are on immunosuppression. I think anyone who's immunosuppressed is probably a higher risk individual and you'd have a test-based strategy for ending isolation. I think it's really important to note: don't stop your immunosuppression. Um, for people who get crit critically ill, there has been under very supervised settings, pulling back from immunosuppression, but on your own at home out of fear, I think it's important not to stop immunosuppression. And in particular, keep in close contact with providers. Um, call them before coming to the hospital, trying to figure out ways to triage and to stay as safe as possible. Um, next slide, please. Last but not least is chronic kidney disease. And I think this is in many ways the hardest um, situation. These are people who are not on dialysis, who don't have transplants, and many appointments um, for these individuals have been canceled. There's a lot more telehealth use, um, but we're all learning how to do this um, and how to best engage with patients and their families. So I think in this situation, it's really important for patients just to make sure they're maintaining contact. Um, and for those who have really particularly late stage chronic kidney disease, um, to recognize that kidney disease still can progress when you're at home during pandemics and to really make a priority to come up with what your plan is for dialysis and dialysis access. 
longer supplies of medications, and having an idea of what you want to do are also really important. So, um, and with that, I think I'll stop and I'll turn it over to others. Thank you very much, and I look forward to questions um, as we move forward at the end of the session. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Weiner. And um, I see that a number of you have uh, have already entered some questions in the chat about um, about this his really really um, informative presentation. So you can continue to do those. Uh, just enter, enter your questions as we go along. And um, in the meantime, um, I uh, would next like to introduce uh, both uh, Jim Reed and MJ Valerio, um, who will discuss uh, staying safe during treatment. Uh, MJ uh, is the home dialysis nurse manager at uh, DC, DCI Avon, DC, DCI Man Manchester, and DCI Yukon for Connecticut. She's been uh, in the ne nephrology profession for 25 years. Um, Jim Reed is a certified nephrology nurse with 30 years of dialysis experience and has been managing dialysis clinics for 25 years. The last 20 years have been uh, with Dialysis Clinic Inc., uh, which is a nonprofit whose focus is on improving the lives of those with kidney disease. So Jim is going to start us off today and then he's gonna pass the mic over to MJ. Hello everybody, Barbara, thank you, doctor. That was a great presentation, very informative. So um, just before I begin, I just wanna say that, um, you know, in the presentation, I might be saying some things that are really specific for my dialysis areas and, and in Connecticut, potential, uh, specifically. You know, even in our own clinics within Connecticut, there are some subtle differences in practice to accommodate the unique physical characteristics of the facility. And in facilities outside Connecticut, where we are located, there may even be larger differences due to differences in state regulations. So what you're seeing in your clinics may be a little bit different than uh, what I might be describing, but that's not necessarily bad. That's okay, and it really is, uh, pretty much uh, something that's gonna be facility specific. Uh, next slide. So each clinic has a management team led by a medical director who is a board certified dialysis trained physician um, and they're part of the governing body. This team typically includes the administrator and nurse manager and it is the responsibility of the governing body to adopt and enforce rules and policies to allow for safe and effective care. The dialysis facilities are in close contact with the State Department of Health and also with their local emergency managers. Um, the medical directors and nurse managers that I've had the privilege of working with over the last 30 years have all been very focused on patient safety. And um, if you have questions concerning COVID-19 or the clinic, I think it's really important that you feel comfortable in reaching out to them, um, especially the medical directors who um, really are ultimately responsible for what's going on within the dialysis clinic. Um, next slide, please. So there are gonna be some things that, that have changed. Dr. Weiner had pointed out a couple of the obvious things, um, and and I'm sure you're seeing these. First, we're reducing or closing many of the um, many of the visitors from the clinics, so we don't allow visitors to come in. We don't allow people to be in the waiting area and wait because our waiting rooms just aren't that large. Uh, we are working very hard to keep people six feet apart. Um, you'll see sometimes that, that uh, paid attendants are allowed in the room because they need to be there waiting, uh, waiting for the person who they're caring for. Um, in our clinics here in Connecticut, we're doing additional screening uh, before you even make it into the waiting area. We have staff who are there um, in full gear and they're taking pulse oximetry and temperatures and they're asking questions. Um, to see if you've had any exposures or how you're feeling. Uh, and you'll actually, in many cases, get screening um, at, before you even arrive in the clinic. So our staff will be calling in and checking with you to see how you're doing. And, you know, the major purpose of this is, again, to um, look at the opportunity to divert people away from the waiting room who could potentially be infectious. And, um, you know, we have a very broad net of symptoms that we look for in order to try and, and do that. Um, so even if, even if uh, you might answer yes to one of the questions, which is seemingly rather innocuous, you may be treated like somebody who, as Dr. Weiner had said, was a person under investigation. And this is just something that we're doing again to make sure that, you know, you are safe and everybody else in the clinic is also safe. Um, you also notice that there's more patient education flyers in the clinic um, on how to wash your hands and to maintain um, social distancing. Um, and next slide, please. So patients who are more susceptible um, may be dialyzed in an area that's really separate from, from the rest of the patients. 
And this is to kind of protect them. So sometimes we have some of the people from nursing homes, which in Connecticut have had a very tough time. Uh, we want to make sure that they're protected and that we don't have them getting an incidental exposure um, by somebody who comes in the clinic who's pre-symptomatic. So we'll actually have them in a separate area and may pull their the curtains a little bit just so that um, you know we can protect them a little more and you'll see gowns coming on and off with, an in great, with a, a greater frequency. Um, you may also have patients who, you know, get diverted through another entry into the room that we're doing exactly the same thing on. And again, the purpose is just to try and, you know, limit the potential spread within the dialysis area. And again, you'll see the staff changing their gear a little bit more often. Um, next slide. So we do have patients who've tested positive within our clinics, um, and we have uh, different clinics that are handling that in different ways. One of our clinics doesn't really have the ability to um, take on any patients that are COVID positive because we have no way of really keeping them separated from other patients. Um, we have isolation rooms in the two other clinics that we're utilizing right now. And on occasion, when we have an influx of patients that are positive, we will open a different part of the clinic and, and use it separately just for those patients. Um, if there are going to be times, unfortunately, where patients may have to adjust their appointment time, um, move their chair, or even their facility in order to make sure everybody's really safe. Um, you may also see that physicians uh, or your providers are using telehealth to discuss your care instead of doing an in-person visit, you know, that they would normally do. Next slide. So there's some things that are going on kind of behind the scenes that you're not going to see. Um, we have made sure that the frequency of disinfection in the clinics has in increased, especially the high touch areas in the clinics, including the waiting rooms. So there are teams of staff who go out. Um, you know, to make sure that that's a disinfected in between turnover times. Um, we brought the housekeeping vendors in and reviewed everything that they were using uh, for disinfectants. Uh, we walked them through the clinics, uh, both in the clinic area, the waiting rooms, the offices, the break areas, and made sure that they were attending to all the details uh, and just to verify that, you know, they were really doing everything that they really could to make sure the clinics were very, very clean. Um, you'll notice that staff and physicians have their temperature and oxygen levels checked whenever they come into the clinic. And the staff are practicing social distancing in the break room and are keeping six feet apart in conference rooms. We're doing more uh, conferences by, by telephone. Um, we're doing patient care plan conferences with the patients by telephone. And you might have the social worker and dietitian in their offices and the physician and nurse manager in the conference room, just again, to make sure that we're really um, providing as much distance as possible. Um, next slide, please. So we're also making the giving the opportunity for some staff to work at home. Our social workers and dietitians are spending um, half their time at home and half the time in the clinic just to make sure that, you know, we're decreasing the chance that somebody who is pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic but is positive doesn't bring something into the clinic. Um, and the other thing that the clinics have really been working very hard on from the very beginning is making sure that we have everything we need, um, that the supply chain vendors are delivering the critical supplies, that we have enough dialyzers, lines, that everything we need uh, in order to provide safe and effective care is on hand. Um, we also have changed um, some of our policies, and if uh, staff have any illness at all, we ask them not to come to work. Um, obviously, again, we're screening them to make sure that um, they are coming into work ill. And we've also changed some of our audits. We, we always do um, audits throughout the course of the month, typically 30 or more. And now we've really kind of focused those more on the um, on COVID-19 and what we can do to make sure that we're, we're taking care of the patients. So, you know, like doctor said, there are some things that we really need to do, what we need you to do to make sure that you're safe. Um, one of them would just be to make sure that you wash your hands on an increased frequency. Um, taking care of your home is very important as well. And disinfecting uh, high touch surfaces on a daily basis is important, especially if you share your home with anybody. But even if you don't, it's still really important and the CDC does recommend that you, you disinfect those areas. Um, it's really hard to overstate how important those, those couple of things are just in terms of decreasing your, your potential, potential illness. Next slide. Or that's it. I'm handing it off to MJ. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you for inviting me to talk about home dialysis. Just to give you a brief location of our clinic, we are 
in the suburbs of Hartford County in Connecticut. And uh, we have PD programs and home hemodialysis programs. Next slide, please. So yes, we are open. Um, peritoneal dialysis, including home dialysis, are mostly daily treatment procedures done by trained patients at home. It is essential, and I call this the survival therapy. During the sudden news of statewide lockdown, including some outpatient clinics like the dentist, the, uh, some primary care clinics, the eye doctor, a lot of home dialysis patients assume that our clinics also closed. Even some public transport drivers had called to inquire if the clinic is open. But yes, we are open. Next slide, please. In light of the challenge brought about by the COVID-19 effects to public health, we have to act quickly, swiftly, and with caution in order to implement the plan of keeping patients safe, including the staff. And so we established several key elements as pointed out by the previous speakers. Adaptation of new guidelines for daily clinic routines, so direct communication via telephone reminders and mails. We usually send patients uh, schedules a month before, and so we have enough time to call our patients at home. We then stagger patients' uh, clinic schedule, giving enough time for the staff to disinfect the chair, the clipboard, the pen, the IV pole, and other supplies. We also have new screening tool, and we talk about this, what to expect. We encourage them to call us if the day of their schedule and what to expect when they are at the door. And our questionnaires also has evolved through the coming weeks. So additional questions were added for better evaluation. Um, if they are accompanied by care support or a family, we had asked them to stay in the car or stay home. And uh, about this limitation of visitors or care support partners, uh, the limitation of visitors was discussed not only in the clinic setting, but also we discussed about home setting also. We even strongly suggested patients to also consider limiting their own visitors at home and that they need an open family conversation about their health risks. As recommended by the CDC, we have to implement the social distancing rule as much as possible and for lesser virus transmission. So we took some chairs from the lobby and we are very um, lucky that we have private rooms. So one training room only will have one patient at a time. Uh, flyers from CDC, corporate or ESRD network. These are additional educational materials that we give and because we always coordinate and co collaborate with these uh, health agencies, we have access for all these wonderful materials. And then a uh, weekly staff quality assessment meeting. Uh, we talk about updates. We have corporate uh, meetings and we share uh, best practices as other clinics have their own unique setups and unique uh, experiences, we all learn from it. Next slide, please. So telehealth. So COVID-19 accelerated the use of telehealth. Home dialysis department had a more clear guideline with telehealth as compared with its use in uh, in-center dialysis clinic. In our company, it is in home dialysis that telehealth was first utilized. First, we inform our patients about the availability of telehealth, and we have to get their consents before we even uh, get a video call or email about video type communication to our patients. Telephonic communications are acceptable if no video alternative is available. For example, elderly patient with 
minimal technology or with poor bandwidth. We had some patients that live in a campground, so they really don't have that um, good source of uh, the uh, web, if I may say. Um, and this telehealth uh, platform is not limited to doctors only. It is also available for the renal dietitian and the social workers, as well to interact with our patients. Of course, anything new takes some practice and getting used to. In our clinic, a lot of our patients are more comfortable with telephone interaction. But one thing for sure, all our patients are loving to stay home and to come in the clinic once a month only. Way back, I say way back, it's only like a few months ago, uh, we tend to see our peritoneal dialysis patients and home dialysis patients possible like three to four times a month because of labs, um, nursing assessment, assessment, care plans and everything. And so now we try to limit it for once a month. And in our clinic, um, we have a home dialysis nurse on call. The nurse on call starts from 5 p.m. to 8 in the morning and different nephrology groups also has their own on-call nephrology person. But our patients are more comfortable calling us first before they would call the customer service of the Fresenius or Baxter supply. Next slide, please. With regards to home dialysis supplies, um, we encourage patients to order at least seven days extra worth of PD supplies at home. Because of COVID-19, uh, Fresenius and Baxter made some changes in their delivery practice. Before COVID, driver will drop off 10, 15, 30 boxes, um, and they go, can go inside the house and the patient can say, okay, please put 10 boxes in the living room, 10 boxes in my room. But because of COVID, that changes. So um, they had directed their delivery drivers to just drop off all these boxes in front of the door. So it's very challenging for our elderly patients. Uh, but we nurses will try to facilitate a better efficient delivery system especially at home for the elderly patients. And we could actually talk to the drivers and request at least to deliver the supplies inside the house by the door. So they will do that one. Uh, medication reconciliation. When we review the medication checklist with the patients, we also coordinate with the pharmacist for a one-time pickup delivery of all needed meds to avoid needless multiple travels to the drugstore. And the consideration for self-administration of erythropoietin stimulating agent. So we review with patients on if they're still interested to have uh, their uh, medication be delivered and self-administration. And so we review proper storage, reporting and administration, and then if they will decide that they are very willing to do this, then we will schedule a training date with the patient. Next slide, please. Uh, the renal dietitian and the social worker continue to connect with our patients. So for the renal dietitian support, due to limited traveling at the grocery store or fear of going out, it is essential to review the three-day emergency renal diet with the patients. This is the same uh, diet that we give out to all our patients for possible thunderstorm or winter storm. Also, the renal dietitian also informs the patient about information of the local grocery hours for the elderly and those medically compromised people. The challenging part is uh, sometimes good-hearted people would drop them some food supplies which are necessarily 
uh, not renal friendly. And so the renal dietitian could help them select food options as well as the proper intake portions for the day. Um, the social worker involvement, uh, she will review insurance coverage for transportation. Um, I talked to her uh, this week and usually the challenge now is I think a lot of uh, State Department of Medicare, Medicaid are closed. So she has a lot of uh, questions about that when people are trying to apply for Medicare and some Medicaid um, questions. And in our clinic, the social worker is also the kidney transplant coordinator. A lot of our patients do ask if the transplant clinics are open or do they still do organ transplant surgeries and all these concerns. And so usually our social worker would contact the kidney transplant program coordinator or the donor or the recipient coordinator to get updates on their clinic policies. And then our social worker could relay the clinic status to our patients. It is very hard to talk in general as our patients are enlisted in different kidney transplant kidney programs in different states. Having the correct answer to their inquiries do give our patients reassurance and peace of mind. I believe this is the last of my slide. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, MJ and Jim. This is uh, both of those uh, presentations, I think, really uh, point to uh, not just the challenges, but, um, but everything that is being done to, to, um, to at least try to facilitate um, uh, things for, for kidney patients. So um, continue, uh, I just wanna ask all of you who are participating to continue to uh, chat uh, questions because we'll take those up later. When you do that, if you could send the chat to, uh, just send it to everyone so everyone can, can see. Um, so um, I would now like to introduce our closing speaker. David Walsh, who's going to share the patient perspective on managing the logistical and other challenges of treatment during the pandemic. Uh, David is a patient ambassador for the American Kidney Fund who lives in Woburn, Massachusetts. He currently uh, is uh, in a very successful uh, recovery from a kidney transplant and was previously on uh, peritoneal di dialysis. Um, and he's with us today to share his story and his advice for other patients. And, um, and like all of you, David is not just a kidney patient. Uh, he, has, he has a whole other life and he is, uh, just, uh, he is a, uh, in fact, a chemical engineer technologist. Um, so, uh, so anyway, without uh, further ado, over to you, David. Oh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as uh, Barbara was nice enough to say, my name is David Walsh from lovely Woburn, Massachusetts, just northwest of Boston. I'm uh, 58 years old, chemical engineer technologist, and um, this is the second time the AKF has asked me to be an ambassador, which I'm very happy to do. Uh, like I said, I live in uh, Woburn, Mass with my uh, darling bride, and during dialysis and hopefully once the COVID subsides, we're going to be doing a lot more traveling as we want to do. We're uh, happy to like brush up on some of the languages we supposedly learned in school as we go to different places. Uh, we do a fair amount of camping, even using dialysis. You can get out there. It's a little bit of an extra effort, but you know, it's just nice to get out. Uh, could we go to the next slide, please? Let's see. So I've probably had this disease called IgA nephropathy since I was a uh, adolescent, but of course, as a kid, didn't notice I had any symptoms until I really got out of uh, Northeastern University and started my first real job. Um, I went in for a physical and, gee, your kidney function is only about 70% of what it should be. And well, that's not good. So after various tests and what have you, yep, indeed, it was about 70%. I was diagnosed with this IgA nephropathy and the doctors were good enough to put me on a specialized diet on a uh, limited sodium and a reduced protein diet. Uh, turns out the renal artery that feeds the kidneys is also one of the major players in controlling the blood pressure in the body. So it was necessary to start some uh, blood pressure medications as well. Um, and 
it did pretty much stabilize my kidney function for 30 years. It dropped from 70% to 50% over the course of 30 years. It'd be better if it didn't drop at all, but you know, 30%, I mean, just a 20% drop wasn't bad. And then that was at age 53. And something happened at age 53 where my uh, uh, kidney function dropped all the way from 50% to below 15%. And they immediately had me start on the peritoneal dialysis, they also call it PD, where instead of having a needle put into your arm or some other blood vessel, or blood vessel they have a catheter inserted alongside your navel and it floods uh, your peritoneum inside your uh, stomach area with a liquid that uh, removes some of the nasties from the body. Uh, the first two years of that worked very well for me. The second two years, I was absolutely able to see some of the side effects of the dialysis, but I was still able to work and what have you. And then um, February of this year, I did get a kidney transplant and it has gone extremely successfully. Um, making urine just like I used to, now that I'm in my 50s, getting out of bed like three or four times a night like I suppose I'm supposed to. And um, so uh, they, of course, when you go on uh, with a kidney transplant, maybe I should ask to go to the next slide right now, please. Um, when you start a kidney transplant, you will also be uh, subjected to what are called um, anti-rejection drugs, which are also immunosuppressants, uh, which they start you off with a very large dose to make sure you don't reject the new kidney, and which has worked very well for me. So I'm down to about one quarter of the anti-rejection drugs I started out on two and a half, uh, three months ago. Um, the recovery was told to be about one month. Yeah, maybe it's because I'm in my 50s. It took a solid two months, maybe even another week or two more. But uh, in the past three weeks, I've actually been doing a lot of work around the house, going up ladders, using a shovel, you know, yard work or what have you. Because, well, I can't really go anywhere else. I got to stay on the property due to COVID being out there. So I really only leave the house, um, or I should say the property, about once a week to go to Leahy Clinic, which was the uh, clinic I've been using. And they're drawing blood to make sure my kidney function is remaining as fantastic as it is. Um, so again, um, then again, every other week, there's always some excuse to go out, whether uh, to the bank, to a grocery store, which my wife does most of it, but every now and then you get caught up and I have to go do it. Um, could we go to the next slide, please? Um, as I said, I've gone, I leave the house, or I should say I leave the property uh, rarely. But when I do, I'm wearing a form-fitting mask, and uh, I am now clean-shaven. I used to have a goatee, but uh, we want a good secure seal against your face. Uh, always wear the latex gloves. I also have some vinyl gloves from a previous position I had. I've got a couple of boxes of them lying around. I'll use them too. And um, I keep a bottle of Windex in my car just to uh, clean the gloves, steering wheel, gear shifter, controls for the stereo, the, the electric windows, the latches, just I used to do a lot of forensic work, so I know where the nasties will reside. So the ammonia and uh, the soap in Windex is a pretty good disinfectant. Um, for exercise, like I said, I've been working a lot around the house in the yard, but also our house abuts, abuts the power lines, and you can walk for at least a mile or so, and then the power lines. There's nobody else out there, so you've got them to yourself. So it's a nice secluded but good long walk so you can get some good exercise in. Um, my wife often orders uh, groceries in from the store, and we have a three season porch that we put the groceries out there for a day or two or three to let them, let's say, air out, you know, let some oxygen at them, let some daylight at them, and hopefully that'll lower the chance of any of the virus surviving as well. And um, uh, the anti-rejection drugs I'm taking, I take them every morning and every evening, and I make certain to do that. Next slide, please. So uh, suggestions, I did do PD, the peritoneal dialysis at home every night for four years. Um, I do have a few boxes of gloves and um, masks remaining at my house, which are coming in handy during the COVID season we're in. Um, of course, if you have to, as you've seen on television, various websites, you can either order masks online or make your own. As long as you have some barrier uh, to protect other people from any droplets coming out of your mouth, 
And even if you're wearing a mask, it is a barrier to present, prevent some of the materials from getting into your body as well. Um, if you can't find gloves, as you've always heard on television lately, don't touch your face. Keep your hands clean. Um, wash them frequently. Have hand sanitizer. Oh, that's what, yes, when I was doing PD, they also gave me a number of bottles of hand sanitizer. So I've got a couple of them lying around still too. Um, like I said, I also use Windex in the car. I wouldn't use it as a breast spray or anything like that, but for cleaning, cleaning gloves and what have you, it works pretty well. Um, let's see, next slide, please. All right, so yes, when I was on dialysis, I, in four years, I missed two nights. I made sure to do it every night. And even if I missed a night, I started it the next morning when I could get fresh supplies to make sure that the dialysis would go well. So, you know, keep your body as clean as possible on the inside, but also keep it clean on the outside because at some point you might get the call from the transplant group that we have a kidney waiting for you and you need to be here in the next hour or three. So you don't want to have been too exposed to anything and going in being given a uh, retinue of um, anti-rejection drugs and then, you know, coming out with something on the other end. Uh, so just... It's challenging in these days, but just stick with it and you'll be all the better. Again, I'm doing extremely well. The doctors are very happy with the way my blood work is turning out. They say I'm very much a success story. And the next slide I believe is the end. So I'm gonna just say, this is a shameless attempt at looking for a job. I am out of work. So if you know anybody looking for a chemical engineer technologist with a background in scientific instrumentation, customer service, technical support, please give me a call. Thank you very much for listening. Great, uh, thank you so much, David. And uh, uh, and clearly, you were a man of many talents. And really, we appreciate you um, sharing sharing uh, your story because that's not always easy to do. And and also, really, I, I think um, a very nice uh, sort of synthesis of, of best practices for for keeping safe that um, probably apply beyond kidney patients. Uh, probably mm -hmm. would be. Um, uh, uh, well observed. Um, okay, so um, before we, we're going to transition to the question and answer, but uh, before we do that, I've got um, uh, a second poll that I am going to to launch. Um, and uh, whoops, there we go. Um, so just uh, there are two there are two questions here, so you can just scroll scroll down on the right and and uh, uh, answer both of those. Um, we'll, um, I'll keep this up here for, for just a little bit to give you a chance to respond and then we'll show, share the, uh, share the responses. Um, and in, actually in the meantime, uh, while, while we're doing that, um, uh, I will go ahead and, uh, introduce the moderator for, for the Q and A. Um, so, uh, that is, uh, uh, Molly Alawade. And uh, Molly is the Director of Education at the American Kidney Fund. Um, she's going to, uh, as soon as we close the poll, she will uh, explain how the Q&A is going to work and uh, we'll take it from there. So, um, all right, I'm gonna uh, now stop, uh, we'll stop the polling and uh, Molly, if it's okay, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you all for attending this town hall this afternoon, and thank you for the questions that you sent in so far. As a reminder, you will see on your screen a chat icon that you can click that opens up a box. You can type and send your messages in that box. Please let us know if your question is for a specific presenter. We will address as many questions as we can. You will also see that you have the option to raise your hand. As you see on your screen, there is a participants icon that you can click. Once you've clicked that, a box of names will pop up, and at the bottom of the box, you will see raise hand. You, we will call on people with raised hands as time permits. If you are currently muted, you can select unmute if you are called upon so that you can share your question with us. Now, as a reminder, this meeting is being recorded and the chats are retained as well. Audience members' videos are not displayed in our recording, but spoken comments are recorded. If you have concerns about recording, please chat to the Betsy Lehman Center. 
And because of this recording, please do not share any sensitive information that you do not want to have recorded and kindly refrain from naming individual clinicians or staff when speaking about your care. All right, so let's jump into some of the questions that we've received so far. Um, so Dr. Wiener, I saw that you already responded to one in the chat, but I wanna make sure that it gets into the recording. So I'll read it aloud again. Um, so this person asked about acute kidney injury, also known as AKI. Um, and how it's being experienced by some COVID patients. So the question is, how does the virus affect the kidneys? So this is, this is a great question. And I think the answer is we don't entirely know. There's probably two different things that are going on. Number one is when people have vulnerable kidneys and they get very sick, they can develop acute kidney injury. Um, and with the sickest people from COVID, this has been pretty common and you probably all heard, seen reports from New York about Dallas capacities being stretched. Um, they're, they're, that's a really common thing. The other thing is, and there's some data that are showing that the virus itself can infect the kidney. And this can cause, um, there's reports of having a lot of proteinuria, some, some hematuria or blood, so blood or protein, um, decreased kidney function, and other types of injury. And I think we don't 100% understand how that works or what's going on. And it's really, it really highlights um, that we don't really know how to treat acute kidney injury and how to prevent it. And as, an, as a huge research priority for, for the field that we need to better know what we're doing in AKI. James or MJ, would either of you like to jump in? All right, then we'll move on to the next question. Um, someone asked, is a stage three CKD patient at a greater risk of kidney failure or end stage renal disease if they get sick from COVID-19? And anyone can take this. I guess that one's probably mine again. That's for you, Doc. <laughs> um, unfortunately, the answer is yes. Um, the lower your kidney function, um, use a number called GFR. Um, so stage three is a GFR between 30 and 60. You can roughly think of that as 30 to 60% kidney function. You, it, it suggests that you have vulnerable kidneys. And if you get really sick, um, those kidneys are more vulnerable if you get low blood pressure or other factors like that. Um, that stated, the vast majority of people who are getting COVID um, are not getting acute kidney injury. I and mean, we see the people who are getting very sick are, and there has been a lot, but there's also been a lot of COVID out there. Um, so people can do very well, even if they have stage three chronic kidney disease or later stage chronic kidney disease um, and, and not develop kidney failure. Thank you for that answer. Um, so now that we have a, quite a few questions about dialysis. So these might be for James and MJ. Um, so one person asked, are there plans to expand home hemodialysis as a safer dialysis modality? MJ, I think that's you. Yes, so um, we start with the, um, whenever they say stay safe, stay home, I think everybody will get this because we are living at the moment, stay home and stay safe. And uh, we just had, a um, discussion from our corporate that uh, patients on home dialysis have actually lesser uh, problem with COVID as compared to the in-center. So I hope that more research and more um, education about the safety and the availability of uh, home, dialysis, home dialysis will actually get the people rethink of their um, modality choices and we will have a better understanding of uh, what we can really actually do at home. And just to add to that, I mean, our real excitement 10 months ago was the Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative, um, whereby CMS and, and CMMI, so the, the government was really making a huge push to getting more people at home trying to get more patient-centered care. 
I, I certainly hope that COVID-19 doesn't side rail many of those efforts. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think it really highlights the importance of, of doing as much as possible at home instead of in hemodialysis facilities. I just want to add that we certainly are, as MJ had said in her first slide, open for business. And, you know, we, we want the opportunity to try and, and train patients who are interested in, in both home hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis and our staff and ready to do that. Um, so just know that there's an opportunity and, and available resources to make that happen. So going off of that, we have another question about home hemodialysis. Um, someone asked, given the risk of COVID-19 in center, will doctors begin to consider home hemodialysis without care partners? I certainly uh, hope so. Yeah, it would, it would be nice. I just, I want to simply say that the Department of, uh, of Health in Connecticut has made that um, an issue. So for us as a training center, um, we need to be able to sh be sure that you have somebody that's there that can be with you during your dialysis um, treatments. Um, so that's just a, um, one potential obstacle. MJ, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, so other states does not require um, partners. Yeah, and if, I mean, COVID's taught us one thing is that we have been underutilizing telehealth resources and remote monitoring um, in the last several months. I mean, what we were able to do with remote monitoring has just come yeah. by leaps and bounds. And home hemodialysis um, is something where remote monitoring can make a huge difference if it's done well and done effectively. Um, this was done in Canada. This was done in, in many other places. And, and we should be using more of it here to get more people at home. DCI actually has a, a center that specializes in that, as a matter of fact, and, uh, and it is something that's available. Up in New York. Yep. Great. So we have another question. Um, someone asked, for elderly kidney patients on dialysis, will there be any special changes in the way that they are treated, given that they are most at risk? I talked a little bit about that earlier in my presentation, and we are taking steps to make sure that people who are more vulnerable um, do have some protection. Typically, some of those patients are those who are living in extended care facilities, um, and those people are sometimes clustered together, not because we're, we're worried uh, about them per se, other than they are more at risk. Does um, anyone have anything to add? I, th I think it's universal precautions. I, I think by making sure we can maximize physical distancing among all dialysis patients is the way that we can keep the most vulnerable patients the safest. By making sure that cleaning is happening the best, that staff is masking all the time, that we have avoiding crowded waiting rooms and avoiding crowded break rooms. Um, the more keeping one or two people safe has a direct effect on keeping the entire facility safe. So actually going off of that, someone else has asked, how long should someone with kidney disease wait before they see a doctor if they think they have COVID-19 symptoms? That is a fantastic question. Um, what I would say is that everybody is different and what you should definitely be doing is calling your doctor. Um, get in touch with your healthcare provider. They'll know your history. It may be that you specifically need to figure out a way to check your oxygenation. For dialysis patients, it's a little bit different because you have to do your dialysis. If you're in center hemodialysis patients, you have to do your dialysis. Um, and there you'll want to call them before you come to dialysis. But for, for CKD, non dialysis patients, other people, I would just get on the phone um, because everybody's going to be different and there's certain questions that we're going to want to ask in order to be able to figure out what the risk is, whether you need a test, how to get you tested, um, and then what to do about it. Great. So um, we actually have a question from a caregiver. Um, this person asked, what precautions should I take as a caregiver and assistant to my husband who does home dialysis? 
So uh, this is MJ. So I would say, again, it's a tough love. Limit your traveling, limit your visitors at home, hand washing, wearing your mask always, especially when you're doing the procedure and uh, hunker down with the patient at home. That's great advice. So I see that we are a little bit over time and I appreciate everyone for staying on for so long. I'm just gonna ask one last question here. Um, someone asked, for a 32-year-old healthy transplant patient, what advice would you give to protect yourself when you go outside? Is a mask necessary? And if so, what kind of mask? And should I wear gloves or would a face shield help? Why don't, why don't I try this one? Um, first of all, outside is a much safer place than inside. And and I'm personally a huge believer in staying active and exercise and everything like that. And it's so much more important that you maintain your activity, maintain your health than sitting inside and remaining away from everybody. Right now, it's a, a beautiful day here in New England, 75 degrees, and it's time to go outside. Um, because outside is big and outside has wind and outside has atmosphere, your risk of getting infected from somebody else is much, much, much lower than it is in an inside contained space. So I think largely if you observe standard precautions in this COVID era, trying to keep physically distant from people, um, wear a mask if you're going to come into contact with people, but it can just be, I mean, whatever mask you feel most comfortable with, but largely you just want other people also be wearing masks. It does not need to be something fancy because again, your chances of getting something outside because of just the way things distribute in that open space is, is much lower. So it's much more important you get outside, you engage with life, engage with exercise, engage with the environment um, than avoiding all contact altogether. Well, that's wonderful advice to end on. I just want to thank the panelists so much for such a great discussion this afternoon. I'll turn great. it back over to Barbara. Great. Um, so, uh, so thank you, Molly, and thanks to uh, all of the presenters and to the participants. Those were actually great questions and uh, really uh, helpful answers. Um, so to close, we want to do two things. Uh, the first is just to let you know that you can email us with uh, any uh, feedback, questions, comments, uh, Michelle from the Betsy Lehman Center is, um, is going to uh, send you the email via the chat. Um, and you can also email her right back if you want to share, uh, share anything right now with us. Um, you can also email us your email addresses if you would like to be uh, added to our distribution lists and, and stay in touch. Um, the second thing is I'm going to launch the final poll, um, which is um, really, uh, to, we want to hear from, from you um, about um, uh, how you felt about this town hall. Uh, and, uh, you know, is this, is this, was this a useful way for you to spend uh, your time? Would you uh, like us to do another one uh, in the future? So um, there are a few questions up there. And again, you can just kind of scroll down on the, the right. There are four questions. And what I'm going to do is um, I will leave this, um, I'm going to leave this open uh, for a few minutes as we close out, just so we don't cut off any of your responses um, and probably won't, uh, you don't need to feel like you to stick around to, to share the results. But um, anyway, uh, uh, what we will do now is again, just a final thank you and uh, uh, for spending this time with us. Be safe, be healthy, and uh, we look forward to, uh, to seeing you again soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you for having us.